Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Level Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. Today, I got called out to come take a look at this 2003. This is a Chrysler Town & Country. It's got the V6 3.3 liter engine, and the customer complaint is that the vehicle is a no crank, no start. Uh, they already had a mechanic come out and take a look at it, and they replaced the starter motor. However, even after replacing the starter motor, the vehicle still does not crank, and so they wanted me to check it out. It's a bit windy out today. I'm sorry if the audio is kind of noisy, but I didn't bring my microphone, so hopefully we can make this thing work. I'm gonna try to run through this diagnostic really fast because I got a tight schedule today and I've got a concert tonight that I don't want to miss anyway you guys know how we do it let's go ahead and get started all right so first things first let's go ahead and verify the concern I've got the keys in my hand here so I'm gonna step inside the truck and we're going to attempt to crank this thing keys in the ignition turn the ignition on and let's try to crank it and as you guys can see I am turning the key here and nothing is happening so turn it off turn it back on crank and I've got my foot on the brake pedal here but still we have no crank. So a couple things I like to look at first whenever I'm dealing with the no crank situation. If you guys have watched any of my videos, you'll know that I typically do this first is we take a look at the instrument panel. And if you look over here, um, what we're gonna try to look for is any indication of maybe some type of security light, maybe even a check engine light. So I'm gonna turn the key off and then turn the key back on. And you guys can see we do have a check engine light illuminated there. However, I don't see any security light. I'm not sure about this little red dot here. I wonder uh, exactly what this is. I'm not really sure. However, again, you guys can see that uh, this thing is a no crank, no start. So I guess what we could start by doing is connecting the scan tool and seeing if we have any codes, making sure we have communication. Uh, one of the other things, by the way, we can see is that it is showing that it is in park. And so if this is an issue with the park neutral safety switch, um, even if we put it in neutral here, let's try to crank it. Still does not crank in neutral. Put it back in park and it still does not crank so again let me go ahead and grab the scan tool and we'll see what we can find all right so i got a mess back here but we're going to go ahead and reach for the launch open this thing up grab our scan tool so we'll just locate the obd2 port which is right here and we'll stick this thing in there okay so i've got the scan tool powered up again we're using the launch x431 pro 3s plus and i'm going to click on intelligent diagnosis and we're going to let this thing read the vin number enter VIN number usually it can automatically detect the VIN why is it not detecting the VIN now okay I guess let's go ahead and enter the VIN number manually okay so I went ahead and I manually inputted the VIN we're gonna go into diagnostic I'm not really sure why I had to manually input the VIN number I mean that may be a sign as to what's going on here maybe we have a communication issue and so that might be just a hint of what is to come because uh, usually this thing has no problem identifying the VIN number. You can see it says communicating, please wait. It's been doing this for a little while now. So that is not a good sign. Okay guys, so I've been staring at this thing for a minute now. Uh, there it goes. So it's telling me that uh, it can't support the automatic search function. Okay, so I'm not sure what that's all about because I already manually inputted the VIN number. So. Yeah, this is not working for us. So let's go ahead and just end the session here. We'll just go into local diagnose, American, Chrysler. Then we're going to manually select. This is a 2003, so let's scroll down here. Again, this is a town and country, so we'll select that. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go into system selection and we're going to directly try to communicate with our PCM, which is the powertrain control module. And let's see if we have any communication. Okay guys, so there is our problem. We don't have any communication with the vehicle ECU. Now, what we could try to do is go back over here and try to communicate with uh, something else. I guess what we could do is run a health report and what that's gonna do is it's going to scan all of the modules in the vehicle and then we're gonna see what we have communication with and what we don't have communication with. You can see that it's scanning right now and already it's telling us that the PCM powertrain control module is not equipped. That's pretty interesting there. Now, one of the things I did wanna mention is if you guys look up here at the top, you can see that our battery voltage, I mean, it's hanging around 12 and a half volts. So our battery shouldn't be a problem here. All right, guys, so this thing just finished scanning all of the modules and you can see that we have plenty of communication with everything else that's on board here. So starting with the TCM up here at the top, you can see that we do have a code for battery being disconnected. Um, over here for the ABS module, we do have some codes for uh, pump circuit failure. 
a cab internal failure, some system voltage codes. Then we have the BCM, it says engine messages not received. That kind of follows with what we're seeing here that we don't have communication with the ECM or the PCM. And then if you look here, the HVAC, you can see it's telling us it's having a communication failure with the PCM as well. And then over here, the IPM, it's telling us that it has communication faults as well. Over here in the instrument cluster, you can see that we have improper power down detected. And then over here in the skim module, we have transponder communication failure, transponder ID mismatch, serial link external failure, and PCM status failure. So like I said, uh, we can pretty much communicate with every other module on this vehicle. However, we have no communication with the PCM. Now, whenever we have this case of not being able to communicate with the PCM, but we can still communicate with every other module on the system. For the most part, we can generally rule out any issue with the CAN bus communication system. Anyways, this being a 2003, I don't think it has much of a CAN bus communication system, if any at all. But like I said, the PCM is what we're gonna focus on. Let's take a look at it and see what we can find. All right, so looking under the hood, luckily our computer is actually really easy to get to. So if you look right up here, this is our PCM. Looks like maybe somebody was already here because you know, usually these have some type of plastic cover on the back of these connectors, but both of these connectors are exposed from the backside. Now, I'm not sure about that. However, like I said, from experience, most of these connectors are always covered up. So let's start by doing a visual inspection, taking a look at the wiring harness, making sure that there isn't any obvious damage, any signs of rodents that have been in here chewing any wires. I don't see any obvious signs. So I don't think that's really gonna tell us anything. All right guys, so obviously we need to do some basic checks. Uh, we need to figure out why this PCM is not powering up or not communicating. So the first thing we need to do is check the main powers and grounds at the computer uh, and also check the 5 volt reference circuit because it is possible that we could have maybe a bad sensor that's shorted out and it's shorting out the 5 volt reference. So I guess that's probably one of the first things we can do because these sensors are really easy to get to. I think there's a map sensor right up here at the top. We can just back probe it and see if we got our 5 volt reference. Then we'll go ahead and pull up a wiring diagram and try to locate our main powers and grounds. All right, so I've got the power probe here. I'm gonna go ahead and hook it up to the battery. Negative, then positive. By the way, guys, this is a brand new battery. You can even see the date code on there, uh, 4 of 22. So let's go ahead and take our power probe and then we'll take this back probe here. Now let's go over to our red and yellow wire here. I'm gonna back probe this. We're gonna take our power probe and shove it into the backside. Ooh, and check that out, guys. Uh, we have a ground there. Okay, so let me go ahead and unplug the sensor, and we're gonna see if our five volt reference is there unplugged. Okay, so I've got the sensor unplugged, and I'm still back probed on the uh, red and yellow wire. And again, we're not showing any five volt reference there. Let me switch over to the blue wire, stick the power probe in again. And again, we don't have a 5 volt reference there. And finally, our purple wire. Got the back probe in that purple wire there. We're gonna take the power probe and touch it again. And once again, we don't show a 5 volt reference. Okay guys, so just because we don't show a 5 volt reference here at this connector for this map sensor, doesn't mean that the 5 volt reference is being taken down to ground. It could just mean that the PCM itself is not sending out the 5 volt reference to begin with. So I think the next thing we should probably do is go ahead and pull up a wiring diagram and try to find out which ones are the powers and grounds so that we can check those and verify that the PCM has everything it needs in order to even send out the 5 volt reference. And then we'll take a look at the 5 volt reference circuit and see what all is involved in that circuit. All right guys, so let me take you over to my laptop and show you the wiring diagram. All right guys, so here we have the layout for the PCM. I already went ahead and I highlighted our main powers and grounds. And so if we take a look over here to the left, you can see that this here is our PCM and this is gonna be our C1 connector. There are two connectors on this PCM, the C1 and the C2. Over here on the C1, uh, first of all, we have pin number 10, which is a black and brown wire. That's going to be one of our main grounds. Then we have pin number 20, which is a pink and gray wire. And if you read here, you can see this is from the ignition switch, run start. Uh, so if we follow this up, you can see that this actually comes from uh, the ignition switch over here. So essentially, this power at pin 20 on this pink and gray wire is only gonna be a power with the ignition switch on. Now, if we move over to the other side, our connector C2, I've already got these highlighted as well. And so if we take a look, you can see that on pin number 46, this orange and red wire, that's going to be a fused battery power source. And so this one comes directly from the battery positive. And so that means that 
this power at pin 46 is going to be a power at all times. Now if we move over to pin 50, it's a black and dark green wire and you can see that this is another one of our main grounds. So that's pretty much it when it comes to our main powers and grounds. Again, we've got two powers. One of them is an ignition power, meaning that it only has power with the ignition switch on. The other one's going to be a battery power, meaning it has power at all times. And then we have two main grounds. Now, if we scroll down here, the next thing I wanted to show you guys was our 5 volt supply. This is going to be our 5 volt reference supply coming from the PCM. And if I highlight it, you can see it's a pink and yellow wire on pin number 61. And if we follow it over, uh, we can see what sensors are involved in this 5 volt reference circuit. So if you follow number 10 here on the chart, this is going to be our pink and yellow wire. Let me deselect this one so we don't get confused. Again, we'll follow our 5 volt reference supply and you can see that it splices out to three different sensors. So starting over here on the right, you can see that we have the AC pressure sensor. And then over here in the middle, we have the throttle position sensor. And then finally over here to the left, we have the manifold absolute pressure sensor also known as the MAP sensor. So that's pretty much it as far as the 5 volt reference circuit. Pretty basic, pretty easy. So now that we know what to look for, let's move back over to the vehicle and do our checks. All right guys, so moving back under the hood. Luckily, these connectors are actually numbered and they are really easy to read and really easy to get to. So if you guys look, we're gonna start by back probing pin number 10. Sorry about the sun. I know there's a lot of glare and I'm trying to focus here. But if you look right down here, there is a number 10 stamped on this connector. There we go. You guys can see that's a number 10. And this is going to be our black and brown wire, which is one of our main grounds. So I'm going to go ahead and back probe this. There we go. Got the back probe in there. Now I'm going to take the power probe and I'm going to stick it into the back probe. And we're going to see if we have a good ground. Oh, check that out. I am not showing a ground. Okay, let me double check my back probe connection here. I'm going to pull it back out and make sure that I am all the way in there. I feel it definitely in there so let's try it again oh yeah <laughs> so there we go that's our ground there i guess my back probe just wasn't in all the way now on top of using the power probe to check our grounds i'm also going to be using this test light to load test them and so this test light is an incandescent light bulb uh, type test light and so when i touch this oh by the way i have the clip connected to the battery positive over there so when i touch ground uh, this is going to light and so i'm going to touch this here and we're going to see if we got a good ground yeah, you guys can see our test light is nice and bright. So, load testing this ground, it checks out to be good. Next up, we're gonna be checking pin number 50, which is all the way down here. I don't know if you guys can see it. Hopefully you can see that pin 50 is actually labeled right there on the corner of the connector. It says five zero. That's going to be our black wire right there. So I'm going to slide the back probe in, make sure we feel that we have a good connection. Sometimes you gotta feel it out. Yeah, I can feel it, it's touching in there. So now let's test it out. Got the power probe, I'm gonna stick it in there. You guys can see we do have a good ground there. We're gonna test it with the test light here, which I don't know why I'm even using the power probe. I could just use the test light to show you guys that we have a good ground. There we go, lights up nice and brightly. I just wanna show you guys both ways of doing it. And so now that we tested both of our grounds, we know that they're both good. It's time to check our powers. Okay, so moving over to pin number 20. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to show you guys but essentially this is a row of 10 and so the next row over is a row of 10 more and pin 20 is going to be right in there again this is a pink and gray wire and i'm back probed in there i can feel that i do have good contact so let's go ahead and check it with the power probe oh you know what i forgot to turn the ignition on all right guys sorry about that don't forget that when you are checking ignition powers you need to make sure that the key is on okay so moving back over to our back probe let's stick the power probe in there and see if we have power and there you go guys we have 12.3 volts which is system voltage let me turn this beeper off i know that beeper is annoying sorry about that guys but if you look closely you can see we have 12.3 volts now what i can also do here is i can go ahead and take my test light and move the clip over to my negative post and then we can use the test light to verify that we have a good power so when i touch battery positive you can see that our light lights up and then I'm gonna stick it into the back probe here. And again, you guys can see this thing lights up nice and brightly. So we do have good power on that pin number 20. Let's move on to pin 46, which is going to be an orange and red wire. So let's move down here. And again, we already know where 50 is, it's down here. We're gonna count up. So here's 50, 49, 48, 47, 
46. Okay, now looking at 46, this is going to be our orange wire. So I'm gonna go ahead and slide the back probe in there. Yeah, I can feel we have a good connection in there. So let's go ahead and test it out with the power probe. Sorry about the wind noise, guys. It is windy out here today. But let's take a look at this. You can see that we have full battery voltage, 13.3 volts. Now, once again, let's go ahead and test it with our test light and see if this 12 volts is strong enough to light this test light. You guys can see this thing lights up nice and brightly. So there we have it, guys. We have all powers and grounds. Let's move over to testing our 5 volt reference. All right, guys, so it's time to check the 5 volt reference circuit. Now, the way I'm gonna do this is, if you look over here, I have my back probe in on pin number 61, which is our pink and yellow wire, our 5 volt reference directly at the computer. And you can see I have my little test lead connected to the tip of my power probe. Again, we don't show any voltage here coming out of the PCM. So what we're gonna try to do is we're going to unplug each of the sensors in the circuit. Now, there's only three sensors. If you guys recall, there's the map sensor, which we already tried to unplug this and it didn't really make a difference. However we'll try it again anyway and we have the throttle position sensor which is behind the throttle body over there and then we also have the ac pressure sensor which i don't exactly know where it's located right now i'll look for it in just a minute here but we're going to go ahead and unplug each of these and we're going to see if we have a change on the meter on our little power probe so again we're going to start by disconnecting the map sensor and watch the meter guys see if we have any changes Again, we don't have any changes here. I already suspected that because of course we tried this already and it didn't make a difference when we disconnected our map sensor. So let's go ahead and move behind the throttle body and see if we can unplug or disconnect the TPS sensor. All right guys, so let me stick the camera in here and show you where our TPS sensor is located. It is right there. This is the connector here. So I'm going to attempt to disconnect it. There we go. Now let's take a look at our meter. All right, so looking at the meter here, you can see that uh, we still have no change so we still have zero volts next up let's try to find out where our ac pressure sensor is located i think i found it guys looks like it's located right here you can see that this is our ac line going to our accumulator and if you look up here this is a three pin connector and this right here is going to be our pink and yellow wire which is going to be our 5 volt reference so let's go ahead and disconnect this thing uh, ow come on Ah, there we go. Now let's take a look at the meter. All right, so you can see that that made absolutely no change at all. All right, guys, so it's starting to look more and more like we have a bad PCM. We've already checked our main powers and grounds. They're all getting to the PCM. However, the PCM is not outputting a 5 volt reference signal. And so it definitely looks like this thing is a dud. Now, there is a small possibility, and I mean a very, very small possibility that, you know, maybe the 5 volt reference is getting shorted out. However, it doesn't have anything to do with the shorted sensor. Maybe it's a short in the wiring. And so that is the only theory right now that's keeping me from telling the customer that they need to replace this computer. Because at this point, I feel pretty confident, at least 95% sure. However, there is that 5% that always seems to find a way to bite you in the ass. And so just to CYA ourselves, we're going to go ahead and verify that this circuit isn't shorted out. Now, one of the things that we could do, first of all, if you wanted to is you could actually just go ahead and cut the wire here at the connector and see whether or not we have power coming directly out of the computer another way to do that would be to actually pull this connector apart and depin it and pull that one pin out for the 5 volt reference circuit that is a little more difficult way to do it i know some people don't like cutting the wires however if you do a good repair then it shouldn't be a problem now before i go that route i think the first thing i want to try to do is i'm going to go ahead and take my test light and I have it connected to the battery positive. So when I touch ground, this test light should light. Now, I still have my back probe attached to this lead here, and so I'm gonna touch the tip of the lead, and we're going to see if this test light lights. Now, you guys can see that I am touching the lead here, and my test light is not lighting. The other thing that you'll notice is that we're showing 11.1 volts on my power probe now. Watch what happens when I let off the test light. You see our voltage goes away. I'm going to touch it again, and again, you can see our power probe has gone up to 11 volts and our test light is still not lighting. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we don't have a short to ground in the wiring because if we did, that test light would have lit. All right, guys, so at this point, I'm pretty confident that this thing is going to need a new PCM. I'm gonna talk to the customer. Hopefully they wanna fix it. And then I can come back and show you guys the final result.
Okay, so I just wanted to throw this in there real quick because I know some of you guys are going to be curious about whether or not we had an issue with maybe a bent pin, or maybe corrosion in the connector. So right now I'm disconnecting the computer uh, because I am removing it so that I can get the number off the sticker on the side because, of course, when you order this computer, they're going to want the number on it. So again, I disconnected these connectors. However, when I look in here, there is no uh, corrosion, no signs of water intrusion. And if you look into the connectors, you can see that all of the pins are straight. Two days later. All right, guys, fast forward. It's been a couple days now since we were last here and I've got a replacement computer. This is a remanufactured unit that I got from the guys over at NPC here in Houston, Texas. And so this thing supposedly is plug and play. I gave them the VIN number. They were able to pre-program it for me. So we should be able to just plug this in and start the vehicle up. Let me go ahead and install it. And we'll see if we got this diagnosis right. All right, so over here we have the old one next to our remanufactured unit. Let me go ahead and install this thing. All right, guys, so here's the moment of truth. Remember, they said this thing should be plug and play. So let's go ahead and stick the key in, turn the ignition on. I'm gonna look here and see if we have a check engine light. You guys can see that we do have a check engine light right there. So this computer should be up and communicating. Let me go ahead and try to crank this thing over. Bam, we are back in business. All right, guys, so there you have it. Our engine started right up. If you take a listen, you can hear it running. Sorry about all the wind noise in the background. It is a very windy day, and we're actually right next door to an airport, so we keep getting uh, these big jet engine planes flying above us. But if you look down here, you can see our serpentine belt spinning, so that's proof that I'm not lying to you. This engine is running, and it's running pretty smooth. Now, the only thing that I did notice that I don't like is if you look at the instrument cluster, you can see that our tachometer is not moving. I don't know if this was like that before we got here. I'm gonna have to talk to the owner of the vehicle and ask them whether or not they had a problem with this instrument cluster. The other thing that I noticed is that our check engine light is staying on. So I guess I could go ahead and connect the scan tool and see what codes we have. All right, guys, so I've got the scan tool connected. And if you look over here, you can see that I'm already communicating with the PCM, which is a good sign. Let's us know that everything is working. Now let's go ahead and read our fault code and see what we got. Oh man, guys, you know what? <laughs> I think I know why this code is set. My bad, guys. I don't think I ever plugged the TPS sensor back in. Let me take a look. Oh, yeah. There's the there's the connector. I left it disconnected. Sorry about that. Let me plug it back in. Now I'm just going to go ahead and clear the fault codes. Hit yes. Clear fault code completed. We'll hit OK. Now I'm going to start this thing back up. We'll take a look and see if our check engine light is still there. Nope. Our check engine light is gone. However, our tachometer is still not working. All right, guys. So as far as the instrument cluster goes... Um, I haven't asked the owner yet because I'm kind of reserving that question for later because, you know, sometimes customers, especially if you don't know them and it's the first time you're dealing with them, they can be a little dishonest and maybe use this as an opportunity to get you to fix it for them, even though it was already a problem to begin with. So like I said, I'm not going to ask them the question just yet, but I will, however, take a quick look at it, maybe see if there's some type of function in the scan tool that we can use to probably reset this thing. I'm not really sure. Now, one thing I can tell you looking at this instrument cluster even though the RPM gauge is not working, you can see that the fuel gauge is working and the coolant temp gauge is working. So it's not like this thing is completely dead. So let's go ahead and use a scan tool and see if we have any functions for the instrument cluster. Okay, so looking at our list of modules, you can see that we do have the instrument cluster. So let's go ahead and select that. We'll go into special function. We do have a couple of functions here for reset. So there is a reset learned feature and reset module. So I wonder if doing either one of these would help. I guess it is worth a shot. We can try to reset the module. Okay, so I'm gonna attempt to reset the module. It says performing this function may change the state of the vehicle. Please exercise caution. I'm just gonna hit okay. We're gonna give it a shot. It says complete, we'll hit okay. Now we'll try and start this thing up. As you guys can see, the tachometer is still not working. Okay, so I'm pretty sure this was an issue before we even got here. All right guys, so really quick, one thing I wanted to check was to see whether or not the speedometer was working. And so if you look here, you can see that our speedometer is working just fine. It's only our tachometer that's not working. Now, one quick side note that I wanted to add was that I noticed up here, the trim panel is missing. And if you look, it looks like somebody was up here trying to, I don't know, do something. And so I'm curious if somebody else has already tried to fix this problem. All right, guys, sorry if I'm jumping around a bit, but back at the scan tool here, you can see that I'm in the menu for the instrument cluster and there is an option to do a system test. And so I believe what we can do is a gauge sweep. And essentially what that's going to do is that's going to test all of the motors in the instrument cluster. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the self test. Then we'll hit okay. And we'll take a look at the gauges here. You guys see that? 
All of our gauges are moving. They are doing the self-test. The engine is not running at the moment, but you can see that obviously our tachometer was working. Let's let this thing finish testing itself. Oh, what was that? And it just dropped back down. Watch that needle on that RPM gauge. Interesting. Okay, so it looks like our self-test is done. Let me go ahead and back out of this menu. And then we're going to go ahead and try to start this thing back up. And we're going to see if doing that maybe brought the RPM gauge back to life. So let's go ahead and crank this thing up. Now you guys can see that thing still is not moving. There is definitely something wrong with this gauge mechanically. The way we saw that needle jumping around during the self-test, that is not normal. I guess one thing I could try to do is maybe rev the engine up and see if this needle moves at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and floor it. Oh, you guys see that? It jumped up. All right, guys, so that's proof. The problem with this tachometer has to be inside of the instrument cluster. Anyways, guys, I'm gonna end the video here. Like I always say, I hope you found the video useful, informational, educational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.